So in the previous session, we have uh, started a discussion on uh, interrupts. Um, to continue, uh, the next concept is the simultaneous request. Okay, so we have seen how to handle the multiple requests. We have uh, learned about the interrupt hardware and the other concepts related to uh, uh, interrupts. Continuing further, um, here we are having how the system, uh, how the processor will be able to handle the multiple request uh, that is coming from more than one device if there is a single interrupt request line. Okay. So that is the concept what we have to study under the topic simultaneous request. So consider the problem of simultaneous arrivals uh, of interrupt requests from two or more devices. So the processor must have some means of deciding uh, which process to which IO requesting IO device should be granted first. Okay. So using a priority scheme that uh, we have discussed earlier, it is a straightforward solution. The processor simply accepts the request having the highest priority. So that we have uh, uh, learned uh, uh, in the previous session. Okay. So using this concept of uh, priority, interrupt priority, uh, and there were multiple request lines. So therefore, uh, this particular uh, uh, concept of uh, interrupt priority using uh, multiple requests were handled easily. But now, if the, now the question is, if the processor is having a sing, uh, single interrupt line as we have seen in the um, um, previous session, that is a single interrupt request line as mentioned in figure 4.6, some other mechanism is needed. Okay, so now let us see what is the particular mechanism. So this, uh, if the, uh, using the concept of polling scheme. Right? So if the processor uses a pro polling scheme to poll the status of the I.O. device to determine which device is requesting an interrupt. Right? So here, the basically, how do we poll a device? How do we poll a, a device? So uh, coming to this particular process, so here, so how does the device poll a particular, um, how, uh, how does the process of polling is going to happen? So we have learned in the previous class using this particular what we call the figure, right? So this by setting this particular KI interrupt request bit to 1 or 0, so whether uh, the processor is going to examine which device request KIR to interrupt request bit was set to either 1 or 0. So depending upon, so that is called as a polling for the status register. Okay, so frequently looking at whether the particular KIR interrupt request bit of that particular device was set or unset, right? So this particular thing, um, so this is called as a concept of polling. Okay, so in the concept of simultaneous request, this the concept of polling is said to be introduced. Okay. So now, alright. So if the processor uses a polling scheme to poll the status register of the I.O. device to determine which request is, which I.O. device is requesting an interrupt. So in this case, the priority is determined by the order in which the devices are polled. The order in which the devices are polled. Okay, so which device is going to set its IRQ bit first will be given the service first. Okay, so the processor will try to give that, uh, uh, give the service to that particular device first. So the, fir the first device with the status bit set to 1 is the device whose interrupt request will be accepted. Okay, so now... Uh, another scheme where we can handle uh, this uh, simultaneous, where the processor can handle the simultaneous request is the concept uh, through a me uh, mechanism called as the daisy chain scheme. So in this, the devices are connected in a daisy chain fashion. So this is a hardware arrangement in which the uh, uh, n number of uh, requesting devices are uh, connected in a daisy chain fashion. So the interrupt request line uh, inter is connected to all the devices. So this is the daisy chain arrangement. So where we are having device 1, device 2 to n number of devices are trying to 
to send the interrupt request to the processor via a common interrupt signal, via a common interrupt request line, right? Okay, so now this particular thing, but the processor upon the receival of a you know, active low interrupt request signal, so this particular process, it is trying to provide the service to the device 1, device 2 to device n which are connected. So I repeat, so this is a daisy chain arrangement in which n number of devices which are connected, so they are going to send the request. When the request signal is being sent by n number of devices, the processor will try to accept the uh, interrupt request that is sent by all the devices. The processor then tries to uh, provide the request or grant the request by sending an interrupt acknowledgement signal. So this interrupt acknowledgement signal is it is uh, first uh, propagated to the first device which is directly connected to the processor. So when this device has, if, if the device has made a request or placed a request to the processor, the int acknowledgement signal will be blocked by the device 1. It will not allow the propagation of uh, int acknowledge, uh, interrupt acknowledgement signal to propagate further. Okay, so it will try to control the flow of interrupt acknowledgement signal. So therefore, the processor will try to give the, um, it will try to give this uh, service for the uh, device 1 and it will try to execute the interrupt service routine that is intended for the device 1, right? In case if the interrupt request, if the device has not made a request or it has not sent an interrupt request to the processor, so this in device A1 will uh, propagate the flow of interrupt acknowledgement signal to the other device. So after the um, interrupt service, uh, chance will be given to the device 2, right? Okay, so this arrangement is called as a daisy chain arrangement in which the electrically nearer, the device that is electrically nearer to the processor will get the first chance to get uh, its service from the processor. So this is the concept of what we call the daisy chain arrangement using the processor, using which the processor will be able to handle the simultaneous request. So similarly, we are having a uh, uh, another uh, form of uh, uh, arrangement where the simultaneous request can be handled. When IMO devices were organized in a priority structure, each device uh, has its own interrupt request and interrupt acknowledgement line. So when IMO devices were organized in a daisy chain, the devices shared an interrupt request line and the interrupt acknowledgement was propagated through the uh, devices. A combination of uh, just a daisy chain arrangement and a previously priority structure, what was uh, what we have seen in figure 4.7, will now be combined to form a more uh, flexible mechanism to handle the uh, to handle the simultaneous request. Right? So this is the combination of the daisy chain arrangement and the priority structures. So devices are organized into n number of groups where each devices that are co connected at each level. So it is going to form one, uh, it is it is being arranged in the form of a priority. So this is the interrupt priority scheme where all the devices at the same level are having the same priority and uh, the devices are arranged in the form of a priority groups, right? So here we can see the interconnections among the devices in a daisy chain fashion. So this arrangement is made in order to combine the advantages of daisy chain and both the priority. Because in the daisy chain what happens, certain devices which are farther away from the processor will not be given the priority to uh, you will not get the service from the processor. So therefore, in order to change the priority levels of different uh, devices, so this arrangement has been made. So all the devices within a single group share an interrupt request line and are connected to form a daisy chain arrangement. So this is the daisy chain. So all the devices will get the uh, interrupt request uh, when they are going to place the request. Uh, to the processor depending upon the priority of the devices, 
the, prior, the processor here uh, uh, with the help of the priority arbitrary arbitration circuit, it will try to decide the priority of the uh, interrupting devices and uh, depending upon the uh, priority of the devices, the processor will respond to the request via a interrupt acknowledgement signal. Right? So, if the acknowledgement was raised by this device, so then the propagation of the interrupt acknowledge will be blocked by this device or else it will be continued or the, it will be propagated further. Right. So, only device that are being used. Okay. So, next. So, this controlling uh, concept is not... Uh, uh, defined according to the syllabus. So next uh, we are having what we call the direct memory access, right? So this direct memory access, it is uh, another, we have initially we mentioned that there are three different mechanisms of interfacing the I.O. devices. So first method what we have learned is the program control uh, method of accessing the I.O. devices. So next one is the interrupts and next the last one we are having is the direct memory access, right? So in this particular direct memory access as the name indicates, there is no intervention or involvement of the processor in the transfer of block of data, right? So we are having the memory, the memory and the I.O. device. So blocks, large blocks of data is being transferred between the memory and uh, between the I.O. device without the continuous intervention by the processor. So this mode of data transfer we call it as a direct memory access because the uh, I.O. devices will be able to access the memory directly. So this approach is called as a direct memory access or DME. DME transfers are performed by a DME controller which is a part of the I.O. interface circuit. Right? So this I.O. device interface. So where do you think the I.O. device interface is present? So in the last, in the previous sessions, we have learned that the uh, processor, the memory, all are interconnected via the system bus and where the I.O. devices are connected. So the I.O. devices are connected here. So here is the I.O. interface between the particular I.O. devices and the bus. So we are having the I.O. device interface and DMA is a part of the I.O. device interface. So DMA controller, it is going to play the role of a processor. Right. So DMA controller performs the functions that would normally be carried out by the processor. So for each word, it provides the memory address and all the control signals necessary to transfer the data. Okay, so to transfer a block of data, it increments the memory address and keeps track of the number of transfers. So we are having a special setup here. Uh, we are having the particular arrangement. A DMA controller can transfer a block of data. Wait one second. So now DMA controller can transfer a block of data from an external device to a processor without any intervention from the processor. So this is the main uh, uh, advantage of the DMA. So directly we can transfer large blocks of data between the processor and the I.O. devices. So the processor who is going to initiate the data transfer? It is the processor which is going to initiate the data transfer. To initiate the DMA, the, to initiate the DMA transfer, the processor informs the DMA, uh, the direct memory access DMA controller of certain things. So what is that? It is the starting address. So we have, to, it has to specify from which location the data needs to be transferred, right? So that is the starting address from where the large block of data has to be transmitted. So this particular, the starting address of the uh, memory location from where the data needs to be transferred, this address needs to be specified. So that is called as a starting address. So then how much, so what is the size of data that needs to be transferred? So that is indicated in the number of words uh, in the block. 
So next is the direction of transfer, whether we are transferring the data from the memory to the I.O. device or from the I.O. device to the memory, right. So once the DMA controller transfers the, tra um, it completes the data transfer, it informs the processor by sending an interrupt, so interrupt signal, okay. So this is the procedure adopted for using the direct memory access. While the DMA transfer is taking place, the program that requests the transfer, it cannot get executed on the processor because that program has requested for a direct memory access. So, uh, they need, this program that is getting executed on the processor needs to be suspended. Okay. So, processor cannot execute, continue to execute another program. After the DMA transfer is completed, the processor should be informed that the uh, data transfer is being done, is completed and a return to the program that requested the transfer. Right. So, when the transfer is completed, the information is passed on to the uh, processor. Okay, the DMA controller, who is going to inform the processor? It is the job of the DMA controller to inform the processor by sending an interrupt request. So, all this process is being uh, achieved by using the registers in the DMA interface, right? So, what I explained here, this is the starting address register. All these contents are present where it is present in the DMA interface which is part of the IO device interface, right? So first what happens is a starting address register, we to, uh, told that the pro, a program which is there, that program has to initiate, the program from a processor has to initiate the action of data transfer, right? Okay. So that when it is initializing, the starting address of the memory location will be loaded into the starting address. The starting address from where the data transfer needs to be initiated, the starting address of that memory location will be loaded by the processor program into this register. Okay. So then the number, the total size of the particular uh, memory that needs to be transferred so that is loaded into the register called as the word count okay so when this particular registers are loaded with the appropriate starting address and the word count so then we are having what we call the status and the dma for each dma controller there is a status under control register so it contains certain the length of this register is 32 bits so we are having here the zero position here we are having a flag called as a done uh, read bar write Okay, so 30 position flag is called as an interrupt enable and 31 is the interrupt request. Okay, so when, uh, uh, what is the significance of interrupt request and uh, interrupt request and interrupt enable? So what is the role played by each of the flags is that, so here when the data is said to be loaded, Okay, so DMA now, a DMA controller wants to initiate the data transfer, right. So when it wants to initiate a data transfer, it will try to inform, it will send an interrupt signal to the processor by setting this interrupt enable bit to 1 and interrupt request bit to 1, okay. So then what happens, the information is being uh, the interrupt signal is being carried to the processor and then the processor tries to uh, give its control to the DMA memory for the DMA controller to in get involved in the data transfer. Right. So now when the request is granted, what happens? The DMA, uh, this particular DMA controller, it is when once the data transfer job or task is being done, so this bit will be set to 1, right? Okay, so that is the significance of a done bit. So next we are having read-write. So what is this particular 
when this bit will be set to 1. So this read or write, if this particular flag indicates it is a read or write operation. So when this flag, when this bit is set to 1, the DM, DMA controller performs the task of reading, reading, okay. So when this particular thing, it is when the this bit is set to 0, so the uh, it is an uh, indication that write operation, the DMA controller has to perform the write operation. Right, so these are the different registers that is being used up in the DMA interface. Right, so next uh, figure uh, 4 point shows an example of DMA controller registers. So that is what we have explained all the registers of the DMA interface. So shows an example of how the different control registers are accessed by the processor to initiate the data transfer operations. Okay. So what I have two registers are used for storing the starting address and the word count. The third register contains the status and the control flag. So if there are n number of devices, so this uh, the contents are said to be the registers are said to be duplicated. So that is the point what you have to remember. When the controller has completed, so that is the repetition when the controller has completed the transferring a block of data and is ready to receive another command it sends the done flag to one okay so bit 30 that is called as the interrupt enable interrupt enable flag so this bit 30 is called as the interrupt enable so when this flag is set to one it causes the controller to raise a interrupt request okay so to raise an interrupt request after it has completed transferring a block of data and finally the controller sets the IRQ bit to 1 in case when it wants to request an interrupt from the processor. Okay, if it wants to raise an interrupt send then the DMA controller will try to set this bit to 1. So this is all the process of how the DMA transfers are going to be initiated using the DMA registers. So now this particular figure shows how the DMA controllers are interconnected with the other functional, other components in the system in a high speed network. So this is the system bus processor main memory. You can see here there are many number of device control, DMA controllers. Uh, so, which are connected via the high speed network interface, right? So, this DMA controller will try to initiate the large blocks of data between the devices, uh, between the I.O. devices and that of the memory. So, this shows uh, that figure 4.19 shows how a DMA controller can be used. So, DMA controller connects a high speed network to the computer bus. We are having two disks here, which uh, um, two disks also has the DMA capa uh, capability. It provides two DMA channels. So here you can see there are DMA controller 1, DMA controller 2. So here depending upon how many register uh, number of for the each of this DMA controller, you will be having the uh, starting address, all the three registers will be multiplied, right? So this is the... Uh, block diagram of how the DMA controller can be used in a uh, system, right. So now we have to, uh, next is the concept of uh, cycle stealing. So what actually is the cycle stealing? So let us understand this is an important concept. So this particular DMA controller and the processor, okay. So when we consider processor and the DMA controller, so both of them are trying to heavily use the system bus. The DMA controller and the processor, both of them are trying to use the system bus, right? So be because they have to use the system bus, there is a contention between the processor and that of the DMA, uh, DMA controller. So therefore, when the large blocks of data has needs to be transmitted, so uh, the DMA should be given the exclusive access to the bus, okay, uh, to the bus and uh, uh, it should be given access to the memory also. So therefore, this, uh, po this possibility of uh, giving the exclusive rights to the DMA, so that 
the mode, the setting that mode, we call it as a burst mode. Okay. So, processor and EMA controllers have to use the bus in an interwoven fashion to access the memory. Okay, I repeat. So, both the processor and the EMA will be using the memory, main memory, right? So, to access the uh, data or the information. Okay, so DMA devices are given higher priority than the processor because of uh, the uh, network uh, graphic uh, uh, network interface card and that uh, graphics. Okay, so next because both of these are trying to access heavily the memory and they are going to use up the process the bus also. But most of the memory cycles have been. Uh, the processor tries to originate most of the memory cycles but whatever the cycles that are intended for the processor will be taken up by the uh, forcefully it will try to take away the uh, contents that are uh, sorry the cycles from the DMA by the DMA controller. So the DMA controller can be said to steal the memory uh, cycles or memory access cycles which was allocated to the processor. So this is called as the cycle stealing. This technique of interweaving technique is called as the cycle stealing. Now how to solve this particular cycle stealing? So without the involvement of the processor, whole uh, exclusive rights should be given exclusively. The uh, DMA controller should be allowed to access the memory for a particular period of time in order to control the, uh, in order to complete the data transfer. So that task is an alternative approach to grant that uh, uh, ownership for this particular DMA controller can be uh, taking place in what we call it as a block mode or burst mode. So this mode, in this mode, the DMA controller need not steal the cycles from the processor. It will be given the exclusively rights to access, taken up or take up the whole bus and the memory cycles to transfer the data. Right. So this is called as the burst mode. Right. So DMA controller incorporates a data storage buffer. So DMA controller reads a block of data from the memory and stores it in its input buffer. Right. So in the burst mode, the data can be uh, transmitted between the computer, uh, sorry, between the system memory and that of the bus. So a conflict may arise if the processor and the DMA controller tries to use the same bus, okay, to, uh, if they are trying to use the system bus at the same time okay, to access the main memory, I repeat. So same thing here, the processor and the memory, the processor and the memory, there will be a conflict between the processor and the DMA controller, sorry, DMA controller, if they are trying to use up the processor memory at the same time. Continue. This problem can be resolved using the concept of bus arbitration. To resolve these conflicts, next we have to study the concept of arbitration. Arbitration is a procedure which is implemented on the bus to coordinate the activities of all the devices requesting the memory transfer. I repeat. So what is the role played by arbitration or what is the objective of arbitration? So arbitration is the, pro it is a concept which solves, which tries to solve the uh, problem of uh, contention between the processor and that of the DMA. Okay, so both of them are trying to use the uh, system bus and the access to the main memory. So therefore, this particular problem can be solved next using the concept of bus arbitration. So this bus arbitration, it is the process in which the device which is allowed to initiate the data transfer on the bus at any given time, it is called as the bus master. Okay. So who is going to, deciding who is going to be the bus master. So that is called as the bus arbitration. So bus arbitration, it is a process by which next device to become the bus master is selected and bus mastership is transferred to 
that particular device. So why is this particular device wants to become the bus master? This particular device, which the reason behind this is that the device wants to become a bus master because it can gain the control of the entire bus, right? And it can initiate the data transfers without any conflict. So that is the reason each device or the DMA controller here wants to take up the bus mastership, right? So, device that is allowed to initiate the data transfer on the bus at any given time, uh, transferring the complete ownership of the bus to a particular device. So, that is that is called as the, that device he will be called as the bus master. So, bus arbitration, this process of deciding the bus master is called as the bus arbitration. Arbitration is the process by which the next device to become the bus master is selected. Okay, so uh, this particular, I repeat this bus arbitration is the process by which the next bus master will be decided. Okay, so next there are two types of uh, bus arbitration. So one is called as the uh, uh, centralized uh, bus arbitration and the second one is called as the distributed bus arbitration. Centralized bus arbitration and the distributed bus arbitration. So that these are the two important uh, bus arbitration mechanisms. So in the centralized bus arbitration, single bus arbiter forms the, performs the required arbitration. So it is a single uh, component will decide who is the next uh, bus master. Okay. So next uh, uh, distri uh, distributed arbitration here all the devices participate in the selection of the bus next bus master. So that is the difference between the uh, two uh, mechanisms here. In the first single bus master performs the uh, required arbitration. In the second all the devices participate in the, the selection of next bus master. Okay, so now we shall study in depth along with the figure how the particular centralized approach or centralized mechanism is implemented. Okay, so this arrangement, okay, hardware setup, it is a simple arrangement for bus arbitration using a daisy chain. So here you can see the processor, the DMA controller 1, DMA controller 2 and so on. So here you can see BR is bus, busy, uh, bus request, B, uh, BBSY, this is nothing but the bus busy signal is transmitted over that line. Okay, bus busy, this is a bus busy line. Okay, so now what happens, each of this particular DMA controller, there are a number of DMA controllers as you have seen in the block diagram. So there can be any number, more than one DMA controllers. Uh, depending upon the number of uh, data transfers that can happen. So each of these device wants to become the bus master now, right? So they are going to send the request to the processor indicating that they want to become the bus master. So the request of uh, the, to become the bus master will be sent by each of these controllers on the bus request line. Okay, so this is called as a bus request, active low line. Okay, so next the DMA controller, the DMA controller 1, 2 and so on will try to send the request. The processor will try to uh, accept the request uh, placed by the DMA controller and if the processor is free, this particular processor will wants to transfer the ownership to the DMA controller 1 or 2, right. So the processor will try to give, send back the signal via acknowledgement signal to the DMA controller that it wants to transfer the mastership, right. So therefore from the, uh, this acknowledgement signal in the form of bus grant, okay. So this bus grant signal will be passed 
uh, into the DMA controller one. So, see clearly observe here, it is a daisy chain fashion. What do you mean by daisy chain fashion? So, uh, previously we have learned that the signal will not be propagated simultaneously, the acknowledgement signal will not be sent uh, to all the blocks here simultaneously. For instead, first device which is directly connected to the processor, we say this is electrically nearer to the processor. So, first this bus grant signal will be sent to the DMA controller 1. So, when the DMA controller 1, if it has placed a request to, uh, to uh, make it as uh, to become a bus master, so this bus grant signal will be blocked here. It will not allow to propagate further. In case if the DMA controller has not placed a request to become the bus master, this bus grant signal 1 will be propagated to the device 2. So then the device 2 will be given the chance to become the bus master. Okay. So when one of the device becomes the bus master, this particular request line will be blocked by by uh, initiate by activating this particular active low line called as a bus busy line okay so this way what happens the uh, one of the device can gain uh, can become the bus master at a particular point of time right so this is called as a centralized arbitration single bus arbiter performs the required arbitration and processor is the initial bus master so this uh, processor will be the initial bus master. So from this it will transfer the ownership to any of the requesting device uh, DMA controllers. Okay. So next, so this is the sequence diagram, timing diagram, which clearly represents the sequence of actions, uh, sequence of events that are going to take place in a, a centralized arbitration. So centralized arbitration, timing diagram that, de uh, that define the sequence of events. Right. So here you are having the bus master. So initially it is the bus master, bus busy signal, BG signal that is the bus grant signal 2, bus grant signal 1 and uh, this is called as the bus request. So it is an active low signal. So that is the, re the reason why we have drawn the, uh, the clock pulse in this particular manner. Right? So initially bus master, the control of uh, the tra data transfers will be uh, will be taken up by default. It will be there by uh, it will be there at the by the processor taken up by the processor. Okay. So then when the DMA controller two, if the DMA controller two is being given the bus mastership, or oh, it will try to place the particular request at this particular point of time. Right. So then what happens? The DMA controller two. The DMA controller two. So upon the uh, when it has placed the request. Okay. So at this particular point of time, then the processor will try to uh, give the ownership uh, to the DMA controller two by setting this bus grant signal one and bus grant signal uh, two. Right. So by uh, setting this particular, by sending this bus grant signal 1 and bus grant signal 2. If the DMA controller 2 has say, raised a request, so this request will be granted at this particular point. Right. See, if it is, uh, it is, uh, DMA 1 has not raised, so this request will be propagated further. So this request will be propagated further and DMA controller 2 will be given the access. So when once the DMA controller will take up the uh, mastership, so then the bus busy line will be set. Okay. So this is the sequence of uh, what we call the sequence of signals uh, during the transfer of bus mastership. Okay. So next one we are having the next arbitration method we are having is the uh, uh, distributed arbitration. So distributed arbitration is that here there is no centralized arbiter okay so all the devices which are participating uh, um, all the devices wants to become the bus master so all the device participate in the selection of the bus master each device on the bus is assigned a four bit identification number right so this particular process when one or more device requests the bus 
they assert the start arbitration signal and place their 4 bit identification number uh, on 4 open collector lines. Okay, so it, it can be clearly understood with the help of the following figure. Okay, so here what happens here having the 4 arbitration lines here, arbitration line 0, 1, 2, 3. This is the start arbitration. This is the device A, device B. Here the interface circuit for the device. So each device is being identified with a number here. Okay. So now, for example, you can take uh, the particular two devices, two devices which are contending for uh, uh, the particular device, device number 5 and device number 6. Okay, so which is explained here, assume two devices A and B which are having the ID 5 and uh, 6 as their uh, this thing ID 5. Each device A it is having the ID 0101 and 60110. So now there are two devices who wants to become the bus master, right? So this DFL there are two uh, DMA controllers who wants to uh, become the bus uh, masters. So here what happens, now this particular device is having the identification number this one and B is having the identification number this one and their code is 0111. Okay, what is this 011? So it is going to perform the logical or of all the things of all these particular IDs. So 0, 1, 1, 0. So the logical or of this is being taken, of this ID and this ID is being taken. So you will get, okay, so, so this particular value is their code which will be placed on the uh, arbitration lines. So this start arbitration lines. So this particular code 0, 1, 1, it will be compared, okay, uh, and their code is 011. Each device compares the pattern on the arbitration line to its own starting address from the MSB, right? So what happens here? Each device, we are going to take the logical OR and whatever the value we get, so that is called as the, uh, that code, okay, we call it as an arbitration code. So this code will be placed as an arbitration uh, Okay, it will place on the start arbitration line. So this start arbitration line, what happens? It will be able to decide which is the contending device who wants to become the bus master, right? So therefore, now what happens? Uh, the device that detects a difference at any position, it disables the drivers at that big position. The driver is disabled by placing a zero at the input of the driver okay so wherever whichever position there is a difference now so that positions are made as zero okay so now uh, for example here this is being co uh, compared with this okay 0 1 0 1 it is compared again as the code 0 1 1 0 right okay sorry this is one this device id it is compared again as this code 0, 1, 0, 1. It is compared again as 0, 1, 1, 1. So first position, starting from the MSB, from this particular end, so where there is a difference, we try to make that position as 0, right? So if it is uh, this thing, okay, so now it will be as it is, right? So the driver is disabled by placing the 0 at the input of the driver. A detects a difference in the line, ARB1. Hence it disables the drivers on the line ARB1 and ARB0. So now wherever the difference is there, uh, this particular it will try to set uh, that remaining lines. Okay. So what is that now? From where it has uh, detected a 0? So here these are the arbitration lines 3, 2, 1, 0. So when the difference was detected here, so these difference, these lines uh, drivers will be set to zero okay so next okay so it disables the drivers at that position means that value uh, this thing will be set to one so now a detects a difference in the line arb hence the drivers are 
uh, on the lines are ARB1 and ARB0. This causes the pattern on the arbitration line to change to 0, 1, 1, 0. This means that B has won the contention. So now how we are going to, what is this last line? How do we uh, try to understand this particular last line is that so this particular value which was put up on the arbitration line so that and we, we have to take the uh, logical or of all these particular things right logical or of this value with that of this value you will get this particular code right this is our new arbitration code okay so previously we have got this one so now whatever the result you have got that has to be taken with the logical or of the uh, device id b so now when you have got this particular this is our new arbitration code so now this and this again it is matched this is matched with this uh, no matching and this is matched with this so a perfect match and therefore the device B is going to get the uh, it is going to become the bus master so out of device A and device B so this device B will get will become the bus master right so that is the meaning that D has won the contention okay so this is all about the process of arbitration okay <coughs> So, uh, so now a uh, quick review of the entire session. So we have uh, started a discussion uh, from the direct memory access DMA. We have started uh, with respect to direct memory access. What do you mean by direct memory access? We know that in order to initiate a large blocks of transfer of data from the uh, I.O. device to that of the uh, memory without the intervention of the processor, we are making use of the concept of direct memory access and arbitration is also related to the DMA. Okay. So how the bus mastership, we have uh, studied two important concepts of bus, master, bus arbitration that is the centralized and um, uh, the centralized and the distributed arbitration.